Hi, welcome to Matters of the Heart and Soul. I'm your host, Janie Charlo. Matters of the Heart and Soul is a podcast to raise awareness and awaken humanity to all that is within. We want to be a beacon of light on your life journey. Hi, welcome to Matters of the Heart and Soul podcast. I'm your host, Janie Charlo. And on today's episode, we are going to be talking to Miss Rashonda Roy. Welcome to the show, Rashonda. Oh, well, thank you. So Rashonda is actually an immigration officer. Um, she's also a bail bonds agent, and she is a radio host um, of the Open Line radio show. And Rashonda has a huge passion for community activism and the judicial system. And um, she and I have had some amazing conversations. So I really wanted her on the show just to kind of talk a little bit about the things that we've talked about. Um, But one of the biggest things or one of the things we've been talking about lately was her own personal journey with rejection, um, recognizing that, healing that, overcoming that. So um, she wanted to share her story on the podcast, which I think it's, it's great because I feel like some of the things she discussed um, can shed some light on some other people who don't even know that they're dealing with rejection and don't even know how to heal it. So Rashonda, thank you for being here and sharing this part of your life with us. Are you very So um, just tell us. Where am I? <laughs> What was that? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Okay. Um, So go ahead and just jump right in as far as overcoming your rejection. Tell us a little bit about your story. Okay. First of all, when my story, it's been a long journey for me trying. First, I started to identify any generational curses that may may be upon me and my immediate family and the source of it. So in the process of me trying to identify whatever generational curse may have been plaguing my family for many generations, it always brought me back to myself. Mm -hmm. Myself. But what brought you to that journey, though? Did you just wake up and was like, you know what, I need to figure out if I have generational curses on my family. What brought you to that point? Because I started analyzing that my mother had similar behavior that I also started displaying. And it was a negative behavior of Mm -hmm. always uh, feeling like everyone is against them and that they're always um, low self-esteem. So I defeated the low self-esteem part and I made up my mind. I said that I was going to change this generational curse of low self-esteem. I will break any generational curses so then lo behold it and I started noticing symptoms in my daughter and so then forward I said no I have to dig deeper now it's starting to affect my daughter so um after so many years of going down the line and um trying to understand what happened in my grandfather and my mother's relationship that caused her to feel rejected and then the further I went back I realized that is probably about three or four generations that experienced some form of rejection that they passed on from generation to generation. My grandfather, his um, mother rejected him and he stayed with family members. My mother was rejected because she was the lightest of all her sisters and brothers. I was rejected because I grew up in a step home and my daughter felt rejected because she was the only daughter. And so still, through all of that, I still didn't understand what what it was. I just knew that it was a feeling that I didn't like, and it was something going on in my family that was very negative. So, therefore, I went through different... I've researched everything in the world. I've researched everything from anxiety to bipolarness. I, I went through so many research until one day I finally had an epiphany. Were you diagnosed at some point with anxiety or bipolar, just trying to, you know, figure out what was going on with you emotionally? Yes. Yes. And it was a struggle being that I'm the first one in my family line that decided to attack the problem. So therefore Mm -hmm. it was a struggle. 
but it didn't really mm-hmm. happen until it was a chilly Friday night. And I had worked all night Thursday night. The whole week, I was just so excited to go to a Royal Family Committee meeting. That's on my father's side. So on that Friday night, I drove while being vigorously exhausted. I also dreaded going due to a previous situation. When I arrived, I immediately felt ostracized. I remained calm and humble. Overall, you know, our committee meeting was to discuss previous the previous family reunion. Then we started discussing the finances. So I brought up uh, to my family members about being disrespected at the previous family reunion. And mm-hmm. so they became our rate and the tar. I, I became a target. At least that's what I thought. And the reason why they were upset with me because at a family reunion, which I was so excited to go to because it's my bloodline. It's my Roy. I carry the Roy last name and I'm finally going to a Roy family reunion. I was just so happy, so happy. But mm-hmm. lo and behold, I walked into the family reunion And I walked in, I was so happy, I was glowing. But yet, I received an attack. And what do you mean by an attack? It was an an attack where as if when I walked in, I'm assuming that I was going to be welcome, I was going to be loved, and I was going to get a chance to meet my family members on a good note. But unfortunately, it didn't end that way. The minute I walked in, I felt rejected. Family, mm. And then with that rejection came family members looking at me as if I was a misfit. And then. So do you feel like it was an attack or do you feel like these were old wounds that was coming back up? I believe it was both. I believe that it was old wounds showing up, but also it was an attack in order for me to understand that it was an old wound. Mm, and not only that it was an attack because of that it's because that I'm embarking on several different career ventures at this time and and so I believe that the universe had to make a way for me to understand what would be my stumbling block what would be my obstacle so therefore I was hit head on with it and I don't believe that it was an attack from these people they were only tools used for me to understand the flaw that I had within myself and that something I had that it was something I had to release in order to succeed in any career venture that I had, any personal relationship with my family, any dating partner. This is something that inevitably had to happen. Mm-hmm. I had to be faced with this. And it really caught me at my weakest moment. I worked the whole night and I slept for a little while. Then I got up all anxious to go to the family reunion. So therefore I was weak. And even if I wanted to act accordingly it still would have been a challenge being that I was very tired so therefore okay. when I walked in family would look at me as if I was at least what I thought I was a misfit they didn't greet me and then I they was rolling their eyes at me and then um, I went to speak to another family member they put their foot out in order for me not to pass to go and speak to a family member so I ignored all of those. I was still happy. I was still on an an adrenaline rush. I'm with my family. I finally get to meet the Roy side of the family. I was still having an adrenaline rush. So here I started dancing. And so me and one of my cousins, we was dancing pretty well. We had one side that was like, yes, they're going to win. They're going to win. Then the same side that was rolling their eyes at me, put their foot out so I wouldn't pass and refused to greet me. They started yelling, boo, boo. And so here immediately that old wound just popped up and it's like it started bleeding abruptly. It's like not even a band-aid or anything could fix that wound at the time. And I immediately started yelling, saying, I'm a Roy. I'm a Roy. I'm mm. Colonel Roy's granddaughter. Y'all may not know me, but I am a Roy. I am a mm-hmm. Roy. So it proceeded to the point where I believe that I could have handled the situation better. But being that um, I was still dealing, unawarely dealing with an old wound, I stuck my butterfinger at the family to let them know whether y'all like me or not, I'm I'm showing y'all the butterfinger that I'm still a Roy, which I believe didn't act accordingly. So therefore, that caused me to go to the committee meeting, and I got bashed tremendously. I got bashed. And while being bashed, I was silent. It's like the words that I wanted to say just couldn't come out. 
I wanted to say mm-hmm. so much, but at the time I felt like anything I said would have been useless. So therefore, I left and I went into an emotional roller coaster driving on the way back home. Thoughts were mm-hmm. racing. Hold up. I said, hold up. This is this is something that I need to fix. And I was going back and forth. Did I do something wrong? Or is it that everywhere I go, I'm just not accepted? What is the problem? Because because I keep having these same problems. If I go to my mother's family, I feel like I'm under attack. I go to my father's family, I feel like I'm under attack. I go to my step family, I feel like I'm under attack. What kind of, if, so at if, some point, you have to realize, okay, it's something I need to fix within myself. It can't be everybody exactly. that's rejecting me. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So um, I, that night, I went I went on an emotional roller coaster trying to figure out the problem, figure out the problem. Then I mm-hmm. then I woke up the next morning and I was so determined. I listened to about three different sermons. I listened to several different positive affirmations on on lifting me up because I was down because I couldn't mm-hmm. understand how I love family so much, but yet it always was a challenge for me to get close to family. So so the- so. Well, take us, I mean, where did it stem from? Where do you believe, because clearly what just happened, you said at the, um, you said a family reunion, right? Correct. Um, That was just a wound that was triggered. So where did the rejection stem from? Like where, you know, can you pinpoint where? Yes, the rejection, the rejection pinpointed after, uh, a tremendous amount of self analyzation and trying to identify the problem. It brought me back to when I was about three or four years old, I want to mm-hmm. say. And I was standing uh, playing with one of my cousins. We were the same age. She was like my best friend. We were the same age. And so I had an uncle that was about to leave. So as he, he, he was a policeman from Lake Charles, Louisiana, when he got into his car, he called my cousin's name about three times on the police siren. He just kept calling her name. And so I'm standing there and I'm like, oh, I wish he would call my name too. And and then I was like, and I also, also at that age I was, it's like I would have almost died just to hear my name being called on the police siren just like my cousin. But he hmm. never did. He just pulled mm-hmm. away. And from that day on, I don't know how I was mature enough at that age to even put two and two together. But I know that I understood that at moment I was different. It was something about me that was different. It Mm -hmm. was some way, shape or form that I didn't fit in. It was something so, so that stayed, it pondered with me. Then it opened in a whole array of me just observing how I was being treated by family members. I noticed that my aunts and uncles, they would um, treat my other cousins uh, a little different than I. they would treat me. They would dance and they would jump for joy. Oh, my God, they would jump for joy like they were having a celebration. But when I would dance and sing, they would only nod with a slight approval. Hmm. So it went on to my immediate family. I started observing my immediate family. Now, I'm just a kid and I'm observing this. I noticed that my brother and sister would come home with a C, maybe with a C. Uh, they would do the, have the smallest achievement. My mother and father would, oh my God, they would just enormously be exhilarated just by their achievement. But then yet, I would come home with straight A's. I was a 4.0 student. And I didn't even know that was a good thing. I didn't even know it was a good thing, but I know I wasn't. And they would just say, oh, you did a good job, and that was it. It wasn't no party. It wasn't anything extra or anything like mm-hmm. my sister and my brother. So as time went by, I still didn't identify that it was rejection. I just knew that something wasn't right and I was getting treated differently. I was treated good, but I wasn't treated as everyone else. Hmm. So it went on to, you know, me becoming a teenager. And right in the moment when I became a teenager, my mother and stepfather split up. And when they split up, that's when I 
they finally told me that he wasn't my real father. He was only mm. my stepfather. And that he raised me. So uh-huh. up until 15 years of age, you always thought that your stepfather was your biological father. Is that what you're saying? Yes. They hid it from me being that he raised me since I was three months mm-hmm. old with my I mother see. and biological father divorced. So do you feel that is where the rejection stem? Like maybe wanting approval from your stepfather, but him not being your biological father so there was never a, a, that real connection no it wasn't a real connection I believe that he meant well because I want to say that he did everything he could to make me feel accepted but a child okay. always can tell a difference a child you can- just I get it okay you just your intuition just your instincts just something in in you just knew this is just something's not right either he's not my my biological father or I'm not in the right family or something yes and I always knew I wasn't in the right family because I always was weird and I was different always mm. like if everyone was going left I would go south mm. that's just how my psyche worked the whole family would they would do things a certain way but I was always the oddball that thing did things another way well genetically you you only had you know half the genes which was from your mother you know your stepfather that's you know genetically you weren't connected to him which you know that doesn't mean he couldn't have been a great father for you um and he he was I know right he was Mm -hmm. you just knew that there was something missing and I, I can totally understand that um was there a reason why you're, they chose not to tell you, you know, as far as him just being your stepfather until the age of 15? Did they just feel like, you know, you weren't mature enough to handle that? Or was there ever, did you ever find out why you weren't, why that wasn't told to you earlier? Well, actually, from my understanding was, and it was more of the age, I want to say 13, 14. That's when I found out. And it was because he loved me so much that he assumed that I was his daughter. Basically, he pretty much, it wasn't on paper, but he adopted me, and still to this day, he says, I'm his daughter. Okay. I believe that being that he took care of me since I was three months old, that he fell in love with me, and he didn't want me to even, I believe they was also trying to protect me. They didn't Mm -hmm. want me to assume that I was different. Mm -hmm. It was protection and also love at the same time. Wow. Wow. Okay. But they didn't know that I was, I don't want to call it early, but I always was an advanced child. And it brought on to my Mm -hmm. adult years where I always was advanced, even now to this day. I could sit in a room full of people and they don't have to speak and I could feel their energy. I could feel their vibe. And as a kid, Mm -hmm. I was the same way. As a kid. Yeah. So you're an empath. I mean, I call that an empath because I I kind of feel people's energy as well and sometimes it could be overwhelming where you just you know you need some time to yourself because you know you can feel a lot of people's energy um so Rashonda, like kind of walk us through like the emotions of rejection and like you said you didn't quite understand what you were feeling so for any of our listeners who have had bouts with rejection, because I feel like at some point in your life, everyone will deal with rejection, whether it's in your family, whether it's your parents or a relationship or a job or something, you're going to deal with rejection. And everybody kind of has, I think, is levels to this. I think, you know, if you just were you as a, as a child, because a lot of the, our, um, uh, our experiences as children really do impact us as adults. A lot of the, the trauma or things that we go through that we don't even really let parents may not even understand that they're doing, but it can cause trauma. And as an adult, it kind of sticks into your DNA and you, you don't even understand why you've always felt rejected. But when you start self actual uh, doing self realizations and going back then you go back to three, four years old and realize, Hey, I, you know, I didn't get my name called on the siren like my cousin did, you know, in your situation. Correct. So kind of tell us, like, if any of the listeners, like, what is, how does rejection feel? If you don't know it's rejection, how does it feel? Like, what, what emotions do you battle? Like, you said anxiety, bipolar, like, what emotions 
were you battling and you couldn't quite understand? Well, I don't want to call it, it's not anxiety and I don't want to call it bipolarness. Mm -hmm. I just want to feel like, it always feels like you're missing something. It always feels like you're missing something. And, like a void. And like, yes, like a void. Like you have this void. And no matter how, what you do, whoever you meet, it's like that void is just not met. Like, for example, I, when I got old enough and I realized I was a 4.0 student, I didn't, my family didn't tell me. I had teachers in school that told me, they actually begged me to uh, pursue something great because of how intelligent I was. So when I realized I had that, that's the tool I use, mm -hmm. for example, to say, well, my, if my step family don't accept me, I'm going to excel, you know, in academically, then maybe they would. So then after mm -hmm. that, I was a late bloomer physically. And, but then when I did bloom, I noticed I was beautiful. So then I started, okay, using my beauty to get a date partner. And when I would get a date partner, I would be like, yeah, I can show my family. I have someone that's going, that's going, not going to reject me. They're going to love me. But those things only lasted a moment because I still had a void in me. I couldn't identify what it was. It was a void. I would succeed academically. And then when I would become successful on my job, I would go, I couldn't wait to go show my step family. Look what I got. Look what I got just to show them, hey, I need approval. And I didn't know as a grown woman, I was still seeking approval. I was showing, look, I got a new car. Hey, maybe now mm. that my step family would accept me. Or look, I'm beautiful. Look, my hair is nice. Look, I got a nice looking boyfriend. Maybe y'all would accept me. But at the end of wow. the day, it would only last a moment because eventually I would go to my step fam. And later on, they would be happy to see me. But later on, they would start going back to their old routine, mm -hmm. you know, as well, you know. And I would start feeling like, well, I'm still not blood. I'm still not family. And everyone would go mm. back, same with a date partner. You know, as for a moment, it would only last a moment because I would start feeling a void. The minute they would do anything wrong, I would start feeling rejected. But I didn't know what it was at the time. It was a void. Okay, so then I decided to connect with my blood family. Oh, I started going around my blood family, starting to get to know. I said, well, maybe if I find out who I am, my genetically, who I am biologically, where my genetics stem from, maybe then that would make me happy and I could fill that void. So I went visit, I went to go uh, visit my grandmother. Now she was excited. She accepted me. She looked at me when she first saw me. She knew I was a split image of her, not only physically, but also spiritually. She knew it. She knew it. Mm -hmm. So we built it a good relationship, but it didn't last long because she passed away. And mm -hmm. then other family members arrived. They was like, oh, who's this coming after so many years and so forth? And then as I would go by my blood family, I started having the same feeling. Okay. The same void. Every mm -hmm. time they would uh, say anything negative, I'd be like, oh, Lord, they're, they're going to reject me too. They're going to reject me too. So it would always end up uh, drastically where I ended up leaving and isolating myself. Because I felt as though any negative wrong thought word they said, I assumed that I was going to be rejected. So I went in. So I would leave and I would isolate myself a while. Then when I would build up my strength again, I would go back. And I would mm -hmm. be so excited again to be around family. So then after that, I come to the conclusion. I'm like, well, you know what? I don't need to be around family. I'm so much happier when I'm by myself. But then ever so often, I always get the urge to want to be around family again. Okay, so to make a long story short, I met another cousin. And me and her became real close. And I was like in my late 20s. And so that started me on a spiritual journey when I met her. That was the mm -hmm. beginning of a spiritual journey that I had. And that's whenever I started having different dreams. Well, I've always had dreams and visions spiritually. I always did. I always knew when someone was going to pass away. I always knew when things were going to happen. But at the age of in the late 20s, it started becoming at an accelerated rate 
where I was having dream after dream, vision after vision. So when me and my cousin connected, we talked about it and we became the best of friends. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I researched and by me becoming spiritually conscious, that pretty much helped me to get over me uh, feeling some kind of way. I still didn't identify the the void. Mm -hmm. Yes, I still didn't know what it was, but it helped me. It helped Mm -hmm. me to succeed and become a better person you know, emotionally and spiritually. But then, so are you, have you figured out the void? Or are you, is that complete at this point right now? Yes, I did. But it took me about eight years after that to understand what the void was. Mm-hmm. What the void was. It took me to have drastic life experiences in order to understand what the void was. I've had bad doings with coworkers. I've had bad relationships. And the last incident with um, my immediately Roy family that I carry the last name of was the final drum line for me. Mm-hmm. And that's when I realized that I needed, I needed to do something. I needed to. But my journey for self-healing actually started a year before I had um, a situation with the, my Roy family. That's the mm-hmm. family I've never met and I was trying to connect with. But something mm-hmm. kept arising that were called friction. Mm-hmm. But a year ago, before that happened, a year before that happened, I actually started my journey of self-healing. Okay, and it introduced me uh, where well, my cousin, actually you mailed me two books that helped me start my journey. Mm-hmm. And one of the books is called Don't Settle for Safe by Sarah Jake Roberts. And the other one is called The Power, Secret to the Power by Rhonda Byrne. Those are great books. I remember when I mailed those to you. (laughs) Yes, yes. And oh my God, Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. And so that Mm -hmm. helped me fix the the problems that I had with my mother. Because not only dealing with uh, rejection, I also had to deal with my mother going through... um, her problems when I was a teenager, when her and my stepfather split up, she was going through an emotional roller coaster. So therefore, when I needed guidance the most, she couldn't be there for me because she was dealing with her own healing. She was going through several situations and I don't fault her because Mm -hmm. at the time she was just like I am to this day, trying to Mm -hmm. heal and not identifying Mm -hmm. the problem. So Mm -hmm. after I read those books, I was able to comfort my mother and help her get through her healing. But then I realized it was still something not right. So after like you were helping her heal, but you're still not completely like something still not healed in me is what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so when I uh, identified the problem that it was rejection, how that came about was after I left on an emotional roller coaster from the Roy family reunion sermon after sermon and after I went through so many different self-help uh, uh, positive affirmations and different uh, teachings by many different people that's when it popped up rejection that is mm-hmm. it rejection rejection it just popped up in my head and it led me back to mm-hmm. the very core of when it started and it started as a minor cut most people say oh that's minor your name didn't call on a siren, but it's minor. But if it doesn't mm-hmm. get healed, it can be festered like a sore mm-hmm. that grows, like a cancer. And grows, mm-hmm. and grows and grows and grows and wow. grows. And through all them years, I didn't identify the problem. I didn't talk to my mother about it. I didn't talk to my father, father about it. I just went on to my adulthood just dealing with it, not identifying that it was something going on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so after it started affecting my, my, like I said, my job, my relationships and so forth with many different people, family members, I knew I had to do something because I knew in order for me to go on life and help people like I really want to, being that I'm a community activist and my whole passion is helping the youth and helping people become spiritually aware of what's going on, I knew I had to fix myself first and I would be useless in this world. No matter mm-hmm. how much talent I have, no matter how much education I have, no matter whatever I have underneath my belt, I will be useless in this world if I do not fix myself. Absolutely. 
we cannot heal the world unless we heal ourselves first. Exactly. So once I realized that I was uh, dealing with rejection and that it was hitting me head on, head in the face, and I had to. It's almost the universe was right there knocking at me. You have to fix this. You have to so you can move on to the next level. Because I had Mm -hmm. all the knowledge. I had knowledge I've been learning for, I want to say, eight years. Knowledge after knowledge in my head. I had so Mm -hmm. much knowledge I would document. Knowledge I would read. But now I was being forced to put that knowledge into action to transform it into wisdom. Absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. So when that came about, that's when I went to different sites on how to deal with rejection. And I did so much research and I started to realize that I had to allow myself to feel those emotions. I had to surround Mm -hmm. myself with supportive people. I had to take time Mm -hmm. alone to, to Mm -hmm. understand and dissect everything. And I also had to, build my self-esteem up because for a long time I thought I was this big confident person that mastered the world. I'm a radio mm-hmm. host. I'm a bell bondsman. Anything I put my mind to I can do. Mm-hmm. But deep down inside for some reason the only reason why I was succeeding in all those things is to fill the void of rejection. Mm. So it was like I want to do this and I want to be a bell's bond a bell bonds agent and i want to be this and that to show people that i could do it and so that you can no longer reject me so it's it was from a place of of i guess ego more than saying i want to do this because this is a part of what i want to contribute to the world or, would you correct. say that correct mm, well wow it's a point because my passion i have compassion for youngsters and people because of mm-hmm. my journey through life as a teenager, I had some right. problems as a teenager that that wasn't uh, didn't go very well. So I was compassionate about that, but at the same time, everything that I did succeed in, yes, it was because of the ego. And no matter what I succeeded in, it always made circles. I always made circles where I had to come back to point A. I always ended up back to point A because wow. I wasn't right on the inside. I wasn't healed. Mm-hmm. I was not healed. And so when wow. I identified the problem, I realized that I needed to heal so I could stop going in circles. Because what are you of- using to heal? What, so, you know, rejection is that boy. Rejection is, is the thing that, dr- that drove you to do certain things, to prove certain, to prove yourself to people, to try to be validated. How did you counter that in your healing Okay, and first of all, the first step that I use is practicing love on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. After reading the Mm -hmm. book that you sent me, Secret to the Power by Rhonda Burns, I Mm -hmm. started on a daily basis is practicing love. And everything I did, I encountered it with love. With love. And then secondly, I isolated myself. I isolated myself so I could regroup and analyze myself. Because mm-hmm. if you're in the middle of the world, you cannot analyze who you are. You're hearing all the noise of the world. In order to know who you really are and to dissect what's going on in you, you have to isolate yourself. So yeah. I took time to isolate myself to understand who I was as a person. Who am I? Who am I? And wow. once I identified who I was, that's when wow. I knew that it's some things I needed to work on. And it's amazing how most people walk around like they're positive. They have this big array. I'm positive. They can fool the world. Mm -hmm. I'm positive. But when they go home at night, they're dreading their pillow with tears because Mm. because it's only a show. It's only a show. And And it's amazing. Then the second part, I eliminated any negativity. Any negativity that came away, I eliminated it. I eliminated it for two reasons. For one, I wanted to get myself together so when I go back into the world and start dealing with my family again and with the world, I have the strength enough to do it and to understand and to tackle it. Mm-hmm. Wow. That was my this is powerful. Thing. I mean, your testimony is is powerful. I mean, it's, it's, 
it shows so much strength and um and this is I just think it's beautiful and it it shows so much strength in you. Um I just think it's it's a very powerful testimony. Exactly. And it's a journey. It's not something that comes overnight. It's a journey. And that's mm-hmm. not to mention brainwashing myself with positive affirmations daily. Mm-hmm. That's one of the, also a step you have to, because your mind is like a muscle, just like you lift weights. You have to lift weights with your mind. You have to put positive things in your mind daily. Because when you walk into the world, you walk in, into many different spirits. And a lot of these spirits are only tools utilized to help you grow. Some are negative, some are positive. That's right. And if you're not strong enough mentally to deal with the negative, it's easily to deal with the positive. That is so but true. But in order to deal with the negative, you have to build your mind up so strong so anytime they come against you, you're able to tackle it in the most effective manner using the 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 tool that has been used for millions and millions of years, which is love. Mm-hmm. And not only that, the second reason is that If you don't build your mind up daily, you're going to be like a weed that grows. Mm -hmm. You could Mm -hmm. be fertilized. You could grow as a beautiful flower. But any weed that come across you is going to choke it. And I referenced that from the Bible, from Yahshua. Mm -hmm. He spoke upon that, where you can receive the word. But if you don't stand the word daily, any weed that comes up, it'll choke you. And that's what was going that's on right. in my life. And that's what caused me to go in circles. Another reason. Wow. Yes. So it, it's a journey. And the reason why I'm speaking upon it, because working in the judicial system, I noticed that I have a lot of brothers and sisters that are going through so many different things and it's not being brought up. It's not being focused. The, well, you know, if we on. think about it, probably the people that you do see in, in the judicial system, in jail or behind bars or whatever you want to call it, it probably stems from a lack of love somewhere in their life, probably rejection somewhere in their life and did not know how to eloquently heal themselves as you have. Exactly. And it's through prayer and determination. It's through determination. Yes. Prayer and wow. determination. I knew. I, I I knew that I had to fix it because I was determined to break any generational curses that has came upon me and my family. I said, mm-hmm. it's going to stop here. It's going to stop in my generation. I'm not passing this on to the next generation. My grandfather went through it. My mother went through it. And I don't know how actually how far back it goes. I just traced it to my grandfather. And here, wow. being that I was the oldest child, I saw that it was coming back in through me. And I said, I was mm-hmm. going to nip it in the bud. I'm not going to feel rejected because I'm not rejected. I'm not rejected. I have to go through things in life in order for me to help change other people that's going through what they're going through in life. This is, yes, exactly. And not only that, this is not healing just for me, but rather a whole bunch of youth that's out there killing each other yes yes it's going underrated of the youth that's going through a lot of different problems and no one seems to care these young brothers in the streets that's killing each other it's it Mm -hmm. it's not because they want to do it they have so much anger built inside of them that Mm -hmm. they don't know how to handle it and at a sudden a young age who you're going to attack the most you're going to attack your brother the ones closest to you your family, yeah. Yes, sure. Your family. Yeah. And not only that, after speaking, I want to give a shout out to Brother Takuna El Shabazz. He brought something to my attention that I that I really never focused on. And he said that he's been working with you for 15 years, I believe. Mm-hmm. And he stated that any child that has a defect is about a 99% chance you could trace it back to a relationship with the mother. Wow. With the mother. Any child that's walking on the planet Earth that has some form of defect, you could trace it back to the relationship they had with their mother. Hmm. Do you believe the mother more than the father? Or do you do you believe he's meaning that I mean, why just the mother? 
That's what I'm trying to Because the mother, mother is the nurturer. More nurturer. The mother is the mm-hmm. beginning. Okay. The father yeah. is the... Well, this is from my knowledge, from how I mm-hmm. dissected it, is that the mother is the nurturer, and mm-hmm. the father is supposed to be the disciplinarian. So therefore, Protector. the minute mm-hmm. the child comes out the womb, just like I was young enough at the age of three or four to understand that I was different and I was weird. You well, know, you know, that mother connects with her child in utero. You know, we connect with our kids when in in utero. So I could totally understand that. You know, exactly. you start and connecting when that baby is still in your womb. So right, I exactly. totally get that. And not only that, when I was in my mother's womb, she was going through a divorce with my father. Mm-hmm. Which so, any stress, any stress a pregnant woman is under, uh, those emotions can trigger down to that baby that's in her womb. Easy, easy. Because exactly. it's all energy. It's all energy. Exactly. It's all so, energy and all that. Wow. That's a great point. Um, it is. It and, is. And I just want to tell you, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you, Rashonda. And because I know where you were, we could say a year ago, actually, almost a year ago. um, Correct. We kind of started talking at my father's funeral. Actually, it'll be a year next month in December. And I just want to say I am so proud of you and you are beautiful you are not rejected you are accepted you know I think that you had to go through that darkness to figure out where the trauma was you figured it out you healed it you faced it and now you're on the other side and you're on the side of love um yes yes And I think some of the points you said, um, practicing love, isolating yourself from the world so that you're hearing your, so you can start to hear the voice of God and the voice of yourself versus the voice of the world and the noise and the positive affirmations and also uh, getting rid of negative people in your life, no matter who they are, you know, you just, you got to rid yourself of negativity. Um, so those were some great, great points you mentioned. Um, is there anything else you would like to share as far as healing rejection for our listeners? I would want to share that um, right now it goes back to the old saying that we need a village to raise a child, mm-hmm. especially. And I don't. I say that down, all the time. I don't want to down any other culture, but right now it's my culture that's having a bad epidemic going on. It's my culture. Mm-hmm. I'm only one person that stood out and and decided to tell the world my personal testimony. And that's only an inch of it. And but let me tell you, you are saving so many people right now by sharing your testimony. Because when you when we share our personal stories, it allows other people to share their stories and that's how we start to break down generational strongholds and generational curses and not even knowing why our grandmother 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 did certain things and now we're here and we're doing the same thing by telling the story we allow freedom we allow other people to be free of their own story and pains you know and it's so true and it's so true and there's so many people in our culture that's struggling with these because you cannot tell me I can't even fathom because I grew up in the town where we still had family. We mm-hmm. still I may have grew up in the step family, but I had a family where we played mm-hmm. baseball, we played basketball. We had where you had the mothers, all the aunts and the mothers and the fathers cooking together, cooking, making mm-hmm. dinner. Every holiday we were together. So basically I believe that's what helped fill the void. But now mm-hmm. we're in a new generation where a lot of children don't have that. So therefore, the emotional trauma is coming stronger and faster. Like, for mm-hmm. example, you have 13-year-olds that's actually killing people. But I believe, you know, by our previous generation, by us still having a close-knit family, that's what saved a lot of us. We may have had problems, but it saved a lot of us. But right now, I'm doing this so I can encourage a lot of people to come out and get together, get a hold of our, our youth. Heal yourself. Heal first, heal yourself. Next, mm-hmm. everyone needs to come together and tackle our youth because, because right now, the main cause of our youth going through so much is, for one, lack of love, 
Number two, anger, because it's something that's buried inside of them and it's coming out as anger. It's that's coming right. out in such ugly ways. And if we don't come together to stop it, rebuild our families, come back together as a people, let them know who they are. And letting them know who they are not only stems from uh, letting them know that they're beautiful, they're everything, and lets them know their their history as a people in a whole. Let them know they come from kings and queens. Let them know their greatness. Because yeah. they'll and their part parents. that they still need to contribute to the world as well. Correct, correct. Because that was the beginning of my journey is understanding the greatness of my people as a whole. When I understood how great my people were as a culture, that was that's what lifted me up first until I had to eventually go back, go back to myself. Once I learned how great, how I come from a great culture, it led me back to myself. Mm-hmm. And that's what finally freed me. So we have well, to go around this through many different ways. Mm-hmm. The first, and step- everybody's journey is different. But I think at the end of the day, it all goes back down to know who you are. Who are you? Yes, know who you are because whatever is inside of you is going to going eventually come out. Whatever's going on inside of you is eventually going to come out in some way, shape, or form. And if you That's don't true. tackle it in a positive manner, it's going to come out detrimental. Well, if, if if what's inside of you is hurt and pain and rejection and jealousy and envy, that's going to come out. It's going to come out in what you do. It's going to come out in what you say to people. It's going to come out in your relationships. It's going to come out in your job. So a lot of times people don't understand that, you know, we can see all your pain. You're not telling us, but we can see it. We can see it by what you're saying. We can see it by what you're putting on social media. We can see it. You don't have to say it. We already can see it. That's so true. And you know, because I like to say as a man, you know, as a man speaking, so is he that's in his heart. So you got to pay attention when people say things, listen to it, because it is really showing the, the type of heart that they have. And it's so true. And not only that, you know, you have a lot of single mothers, not only in that perspective, let's talk about the single mothers. You have a lot of single mothers going from relationship to relationship, from relationship to relationship. A lot of these mothers don't even know that they're dealing with rejection. They're just thinking that every man they meet just want one thing and and leaving. And I've seen plenty mm. of women that have been with numerous partners and this man just comes in and engage them to get married. I'm just using that as an example. Right. That's, That's a good somebody, point. Exactly. Some of these women have been rejected by their father. And this Mm. is the adult years, the teenage years we're talking Mm. about. The first part was the nurturing part with the mother. But let's go into the teenage years with the father. When Mm. the father rejects the daughter, the daughter will look for love. Mm -hmm. The daughter will look for love. And she's going to look for love in men. And nine out of ten, they won't be the right men. They're going to be men that's going to reject her like her father did because that's the energy she's putting out. So therefore, that leaves her with a life of going on and on and on, of dating, 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 not finding the one until she finally identifies what's going on inside of her. Wow, that is so powerful. That's a a great perspective. And I believe that that is some issues that we're probably facing as well. I totally, totally agree with that. Um, Rashonda, I mean, I could talk to you for hours and hours, but, you know, we're going to have to (laughs) sum up our podcast. Um, I just I just I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your story of rejection and the healing and the journey and all of that that you're on. Um, What book can you recommend to our listeners? Well, I believe that the first book that our listeners should focus on is Secret the Power by Rhonda Byrne. And why? The what did you get? Why... I read it and I, you know, I passed it on. And <laughs> it's a it's a powerful book. What did you, why would you recommend it? I would recommend that book be, because it teaches you how to love. And the first step in tackling any problem within you is, number one, learning to love yourself. Because once you learn mm-hmm. to love yourself, it gives you the motivation and ambition to weed out any negativity or any healing that you may need it gives you the energy and the strength to take it out of you anything that's negative Mm -hmm. and once you do that you give room for healing that's true 
That is so true. What is the matter of your heart right now, Rashonda? Well, the matter of my heart at this moment is right now, I feel free. Wow. I feel free. That's the matter of matter of my heart. I feel free because now that I have lifted the chains off my emotional bondage and that I have pretty much healed the wound that I've been carrying for many years, now I feel free enough to go out there and help other women, other young young males that's maybe going through so many things, even adults, and help wow. them also become free, free from any emotional bondage that be holding them down because not only does it affect your personal life with family, it affects your career. It affects your, your, your success. You could be the most smartest person in the world with so much potential. But if you're not mm. free on the inside, it's useless. It's in vain. Oh, my gosh. That is so powerful. And I just, I feel that. Like, I feel your freeness. I feel that. I, I've, I've seen your transition in the past year, and then I feel it, and I know it. And I just keep saying I'm so proud of you. Um, but, you know, it's kind of, the only word I had for you was love. And I think sometimes we have to go over and under and through different doors to find out, okay, what does that mean? But I think you're there. And I just, I'm just so excited for you. And just to hear that you're free. I mean, I think that's, that's beautiful. Yes. But I also want to give a shout out to you as well, because you, when I meditated and when I just pondered, I need someone that's 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 on a positive level that could help me guide me to the right tools I need. I was searching for the tools. I was searching. I was vigorously something is not right. I need the tools. Here you came along and you offered me two books that changed my life. So I also want to give a tremendous shout out to you and I want to thank you so much for giving me the tools that that set me on a journey of freedom and love. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad I could do that for you. Um I think, you know, like I always tell you, uh, I think God gets all the glory, you know. I think we're vessels, and we are here to shed light, to shed love. And I think when you're in certain situations, the spirit just moves through you and work through you. And I think in, in that situation, we when we exchanged that conversation, I think that was just the most high working through me to you. And so um, I would have to say God gets all the glory for that. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just so happy for you. Like I could, I really feel that I really feel, and I, I guess cause I've seen that transition and you're at this point where you're sharing your story and your, the rejection and you're no longer there. Well, you know, are you on your journey of healing? Because, you know, I think our journey is lifelong. We don't, it's not like you get, you may get to a certain place for a few years but then, you know, as the Bible says, we go from glory to glory to glory. So there's always yeah. going to be new levels, new things to get to, you know, new devils to attack. <laughs> yes, like yes. It. And it's so true. And, you know, before we yeah. end this show, I just want to say, I know that at one point in my life, I want to say it was in my 20s, I always pondered because I always was a wandering person. I always mm -hmm. was uh, wanted to seek why, why, why. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, mm -hmm. why did my father give up? Why did my mother give up? My father was on his way to law school. He was, oh my God, he was super intelligent. Mm -hmm. My mother was intelligent. Why did they give up? I couldn't mm -hmm. understand why. So mm -hmm. here I come into a point in my life where I'm forced to give up because I keep coming into dead end. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm like, okay, something... And my mind just tells me, give up. Just give up. It's useless. You're at the end of your rope. Then something else comes in my mind. No, you have a job to do here on this earth. You have a job. And I want to let all the listeners know that when you come to that crossroad right there, where both of those two items are coming to you at a fast rate, one is coming fast just as much as the other. That's when you know that it's time to take out anything inside of you that is hurting you, causing you any pain or stopping you from succeeding. Because right there is the final drum line that's letting you know that you have a choice to make. You have a mm -hmm. choice to either give up or keep on going in life and fulfill your passion. Because when you at that moment right there where both mm -hmm. of those two 
spirits are fighting you, that means that you're about to embark on a journey that is going to be phenomenal. And you just wow. have to overcome. And most people don't get to that point because they li- listen to the negative voice instead of the positive voice. That's right. There's two parts of us, you know, and it depends on what you're going to feed. You okay. know, what, what, what part, what voice are you going to feed? That positive or that negative? The one that's telling you to give up and stop or the one that's telling you keep going. There's, there's more for you. So, and what we feed grows and what we exactly. don't feed will die. So, you know, that's how it goes. Well, wow. Well, this was amazing. Um, wow. You know, this, we went way over the time we were supposed to. So I apologize oh. to our <laughs> listeners, but you know, Rashonda is so passionate. I love talking to her. She is She's amazing, um, and I know that you're going to do everything you put your mind to. You've always been smart, always been smart, always been smart. So there's no doubt in my mind that you're going to do everything that you put your mind to. Oh, so yes, we're, no doubt. Uh-huh. Yes. So we're going to end and wrap up this episode. This has been Matters of the Heart and Soul podcast. I am your host, Janie Charlo. We just got finished having an amazing discussion on rejection and attacking it and healing it with Rashonda Roy. If you have any questions about this podcast, if you want to reach out, anything about it, please email us at dearmattersoftheheartandsoul at gmail.com. Again, I'm Janie Charlo, and we will see you at our next episode. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.